الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده اللهم يا مسبب الأسباب ويا مفتح الأبواب ويا ذلل الحيرين توكلت عليك يا رب العالمين وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد Dear brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. May Allah's peace be with you all and thank you very much for attending tonight's uh, talk. And I would like, before we proceed, to uh, extend special thanks to the Forum for Social Studies in the person of Dr. Abdullah Omar Nasif and also in the person of Dr. Tanweer Zaman, my friend and my brother that I call the Dawa Dynamo. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him more health, Dr. Nasif, and Barakah blessings on the rest of you. I would like also to extend uh, a special welcome to any non-Muslims who might be attending with us or watching this, Ahlan wa Sahlan, or for the sake of those of them who come to Saudi Arabia as well as expat, especially from the Philippines. I love that uh, country and language, Mabuhai, and their language means welcome. Tonight's uh, talk is titled Medina in the Bible. I will be delivering the presentation. My name is Isam Mudir, your brother, a researcher in comparative religion from Mecca al Mukarramah, and I happen to be one of the students of Sheikh Ahmed Didat, Rahmatullah Alayhi, may Allah bless his soul. I'm also a member of the Saudi Society of Geographers. Medina, we have to, just for the sake of the Muslims, explain to them what is Medina. Medina is called also in Arabic Al Medina al Munawwara, the radiant city. And Medina or Medina al Nabi, the city of the Prophet, that is Muhammad. It's a city in the Hijaz region of western Saudi Arabia and serves as the capital of Al Medina province. It is the second holiest city in Islam after the holy city of Mecca. The third one is Jerusalem in occupied Palestine. It is Medina is the burial place of the Islamic Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's historically significant for becoming his home after the Hijrah. The Hijrah in Arabic means migration. Before the advent of Islam, the city was known as Yathrib. That was the old name. But was personally renamed by Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Peace be upon him. Here's on the map, you see the location of Medina in modern day Saudi Arabia within the Arabian Peninsula. And this is a picture of Al Masjid al Nabawi. We move to the Bible. What is the Bible? And for the sake of Muslims who don't know what is the Bible, the Bible is the name given to the collections of primary religious texts, holy books of Judaism, Yahud, Yahudiya, and Christianity, and Nasara. To Muslims, it contains some and not all, not the full original of the Torah, that is God's revelation to Moses, Musa in Arabic. Alayhi salam, peace be upon him. The Psalms, Zabur in Arabic, God's revelations to Prophet Dawood, David, alayhi salam, peace be upon him. The Gospel, Al Injil in Arabic, that's God's revelations to Jesus, peace be upon him. Masih or Isa ibn Maryam in Arabic. Now, what agrees biblically from their Bible with the Quran, we believe in. What the Quran is silent about, we don't reject and we don't believe. And what goes against the Quran, we do not believe. This is our stand regarding, the Muslim stand regarding the Bible. Believing in the previous books is part of the Muslim doctrine which is summarized in six articles of faith. In Arabic, Arkan al-Iman. According to this list, to be a Muslim, one must believe in, number one, one God. Number two, the angels of God. Number three, the books of God, what we're talking about here, especially the Quran, the last book, the last revelation. If they have such a thing as the Old Testament and the New Testament, we have the Last Testament, we believe. Number four, the Prophets of God, especially Muhammad, peace be upon him. Number five, the Day of Judgment or the Afterlife. And number six, lastly, the supremacy of God's will or predestination. The Quran, believe it or not, speaks about the Bible, the previous books. The Quran calls Jews and Christians Ahlul Kitab. In Arabic means the people of the book or people of the scripture. The Quran exposes in many verses how they lost and changed the previous books, altered God's words, that is tahrif in Arabic, hid and added to them from their own lies. And we are not going to be dealing with this tonight. Nevertheless, the Judeo-Christian scripture 
foretold Muhammad وسلم, prophethood in many biblical prophecies. The Quran claims. And this is the part from their book which agrees with the Quran. Where does the Quran make such a claim? Like for an example, in this verse from Surah al rad that is chapter thunder, verse number, Surah number 13, verse number 43, where Allah says, وَيَقُولُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَسْتَ مُرْسَلَ And the disbelievers used to say whenever they meet Muhammad وسلم, you were not sent by God. Now in response to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands his prophet and his followers to respond by saying, قُلْ Say, كَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَهِيدًا بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَكُمْ وَمَنْ عِنْدَهُ عِلْمُ الْكِتَابِ Sufficient is Allah as witness between me and you and also the witness of anyone the witness of anyone who has knowledge of the scripture from among the Jews and the Christians. Allah is telling the Prophet وسلم, peace be upon him that not any Jew, not any Christian, only the ones knowledgeable of their book, they will come and witness to you, O Muhammad, that indeed Allah sent you. But 1400 years later, after Islam, these are the kind of people from the knowledgeable of the scripture, uh, from Ahlul Kitab, that we have to deal with. You see the face of the chief rabbi of the state of Minnesota in the United States of America, by the name Rabbi Menes Friedman. This is a newspaper cutting from an Israeli newspaper called Haaretz, and this is from their website, dated uh, the 9th of June 2009. The headline reads, Chabad Rabbi, Jews should kill Arab men, women, and children during war. And then he said, the only way to fight a moral war is the Jewish way. Destroy their holy cities. Kill men and women and children. Destroy their holy cities. Destroy Makkah and Medina, he said. The rabbi. So, the news got carried out, of course, and it reached the Arabs. In fact, Al Jazeera beats uh, the Israeli newspaper to the news and published it. Hakam Amriki Yadu Nitadmir Muqaddasat al Arab. An American rabbi calls for the destruction of the holy sites of the Arabs and Muslims. And Alhamdulillah, as soon as he made that statement, we wrote him a letter. And the same letter I sent to the Jewish, uh, the Council of Jewish Rabbis in New York. And I told the rabbi, you look like you need an Arabian cup of coffee. You know, so let's sit down and talk, but this talk must be public. I'm prepared to come, inshallah, and sit down with you in Minnesota. I've been there, and let's talk about Mecca and Medina in your Torah, rabbi. We found the newspaper and Alhamdulillah the Star Tribune by June 12, 2009, they carried the story. And uh, it says here, Isa Mudir, a lecturer in comparative religion, challenged Friedman to a debate. But he apologized. He, he's, I'm sorry for that. He apologized very quickly. And we say he quickly apologized and uh, saying that his comments were taken out of context. They also uh, wrote to the chief rabbi of Ma council. Wa alaikum salam. Mudir made his debate request to the Chabad Lubavitch headquarters in New York, which wants to put the incident behind it. So when we invited them to the debate, they said, let's put it behind us. We're sorry, we didn't mean what we said. And the rabbi chickened away. The question is, why did the rabbi chicken away? Why did he uh, not want to accept the debate? Wa alaykum salam. Please have a seat. Sit down. And tonight's talk, talk uh, alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. Tonight's talk comes in response to Rabbi Menis Friedman claim. So let's put facts on the table. Geographical and historical analysis number one. We are going to go to the books of history. We are going to go to the science of geography to respond first to this rabbi and then we finish from his own Torah, his own Bible. He must be either so ignorant of his own Torah or he knows and that is why he didn't want his people to know that the cities that he wanted to destroy, Mecca and Medina is in his own book and we are dealing tonight with only one city, that is Medina and Munawara, in the Bible. 
So the first fact says from the encyclopedia, the public encyclopedia, Wikipedia on the internet, under the title, History of the Jews in the Arabian Peninsula. We read, immigration of Jews to the Arabian Peninsula began in the second century Christian era, and by the sixth and the seventh centuries, the time of Muhammad there was a considerable Jewish population in Hijaz, that is Western Saudi Arabia, mostly in and around Medina. So Western scholars, they say, they came mostly in and around Medina. That is fact number one. And you see here a picture on the screen of the remains, the ruins of abandoned Jewish castles north of Medina. These castles witness to when they come and they settle. Why so many Jews in and around Medina? And this map here, they also did this map. No Muslim did this map. Christian scholar did this map from a Christian website. You see Jewish settlements marked by their Star of David, their so-called Star of David. Khaybar in Wadi Al-Qura, the Valley of Al-Qura, and in Medina. These were Jewish settlements for at least 300 centuries before and during the time of Muhammad sallallahu That was fact number one. Now geographical and historical analysis number two. Two famous tribes known as Aus and Khazraj who were Yemenite Arab migrants from the south settled in this region of Hijaz long before the well-known tribes of the Jews migrated from the north and also settled there. Now consider this. What made those Arabs of Medina, of Yathrib, inclined to Islam was that they heard the Jews speak about a prophet who would be appointed by the Almighty soon to wipe out idol worship. So the Jews came, the Arabs came, they settled together in Medina, and it was the Arabs who embraced Islam because they heard the Jews speak about the Prophet, that this is why they come to Medina. So let's deal also with a ge another geographical and historical analysis number three. Muhammad وسلم, peace be upon him, is the only one in Arabia's history who claimed to have been a Prophet and who migrated to Yathrib from Mecca. There is no other man who did this in history. In the entire history of Arabia, he's the only person who did both things. Others fail to do both. Now, Hijra is the Arabic word for the migration of Muhammad and his followers to the city of Medina in the year 622 Christian era, marking the first year of the Islamic calendar, Hijriya. Now, this Hijra changed history of Arabia and the region forever. Let's put these facts together and consider this. There were many Jews in Hijaz area, mostly in and around Medina, like no other place in Arabia. Why? The Jews of Yathrib later named Medina spoke publicly and loudly to their Arab neighbors about the near advent of a great prophet to migrate soon to where they had settled, awaiting his promised arrival. Now, let us put it together. So many Jews settled in Medina. They told the Arabs of Yathrib about the advent of a prophet to migrate to their oasis. Prophet Muhammad is the only one who did this and changed history. These facts, my brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, fit no other man than Muhammad Sallallahu the Prophet of Islam. He is the Prophet the Jews and the Christians waited. Now the Jews knew it before the Arabs. How did the Jews of Hijaz know this? How did this knowledge come to them? Was it based on prophecies, their sacred scripture? Did the Bible actually speak about Muhammad Sallallahu coming to Medina? And yes, let's back it up now from the Bible. Now, now we begin the real action from the Torah. Because we have to start with history and geography. They cannot deny that. But let's see if they are going to deny their own book. We are going, inshallah, to be dealing with a prophecy from the book of Isaiah. But before we go to that, let's give a, a quick introduction to Isaiah and his book. The book is written, believed to have been written between the years 740, 680 before Christian era. Isaiah is the most quoted book in the Bible, as besides the Torah. Also, it contains the words of the 8th century uh, BCE prophet, according to them. 
And Isaiah has 66 chapters in the book. We are going to be dealing with chapter 21, inshallah, regarding the prophecy. This book now of Isaiah is not any book in the Bible. The Christians call it the fifth gospel. They have four gospels. Gospel is in jail. They have Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. But they consider Isaiah the fifth gospel. This is how important the book of Isaiah to the Christians. Walaikum salam. The Jews consider Isaiah as one of the major prophets. So we are not dealing with a prophecy from any book in the Bible, but from a very important book, and not by any prophet, but a major prophet. And this is for an example, an introduction to Isaiah by Mary Fairchild. She's an American missionary. She says, Isaiah is the first book containing the writings of the prophets of the Bible. And the author Isaiah, who is called the Prince of Prophets, shines above all other writers and prophets of Scripture. His mastery of the language, his rich and vast vocabulary, and his poetic skill have earned him the title Shakespeare of the Bible. That is Isaiah. So we are going to be reading now the prophecy. First, allow me to begin for those of you who understand Arabic. I will read the Arabic uh, prophecy from the book of Isaiah chapter 21, beginning with verse 13 to 17, and then I'll read the English one. وَحْيٌ مِنْ جِهَةِ بِلَادِ الْعَرَبِ فِي الْوَعْرِ مِنْ بِلَادِ الْعَرَبِ تَبِيتِينَ يَا قَوَافِلَ الدَّدَانِينَ هَاتُ أُمَاءً لِمُلَاقَاتِ الْعَطْشَانِ يَا أَهْلَ تَيْمَا وَافُ الْهَارِبَ بِخُبْزِهِ لأن فإنهم من أمام السيوف قد هربوا من أمام السيف المسلول ومن أمام القوس المشدودة ومن أمام شدة الحرب فإنه هكذا قال لي السيد الرب في مدة سنة كسنة الأجير يفنى كل مجد قيدار وبقية عدد قصية أبطال بني قيدار تقل لأن الرب إله إسرائيل قد تكلم This is Isaiah 21, 13, 17 We will be reading from the International Standard Version of the Bible One of the most commonly used uh, translations in short, they call it the ISV, beginning with verse 13. A message concerning Arabia. And then you see quotation marks. Why? Because they say they believe God is talking directly to Isaiah here. You will camp in the thickets in Arabia, you caravans of Dedanites. Bring water for the thirsty, you who live in the land of Dima. Meet the fugitive with bread, for he has fled from swords from the drawn sword, from the bent bow, and from the heat of battle. For this is what the Lord is saying to me, Isaiah is talking. Within three years, according to the years of a contract worker, the pomp of Kedar will come to an end, and there will be few archers, those who are descendants of Kedar, who survive because the Lord God of Israel has spoken. Clearly from the language of the prophecy, it is a prophecy. The Jews and Christians agree. All Jewish scholars and Christians, all priests and rabbis, they will tell you, it is a prophecy. Also, they acknowledge that God is the one talking, according to them, in this biblical passage. So this is a direct revelation, wahi from Allah, to one of the prophets of Bani Israel, children of Israel. Let's, and if we go to the, today's New International Version, another translation, in short, it's called TNIV. The first verse, what does it say? A prophecy concerning Arabia. So, there is no way they will deny that it's a prophecy. Now, does this one speak about Medina and the Bible? We noticed, as we read together, that it talks about three Arabian peoples, three places, and three events. The first people there are the Dedanites from the Dan. The second are the land of Tima and Qaeda. According to Isaiah, these three people each has a role to play in the prophecy within the context of three consecutive events. One event that leads to another event. One following the other. So let's begin with the first verse. A prophecy concerning Arabia. You caravans of the Dedanites who camp in the thickets of Arabia. Who are the Dedanites? According to the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, they are an Arabian people named in the book of Genesis. It is the first book of the Torah of the Bible. This is from BibleEncyclopedia.com. And we go to another Christian source, John Gill's Exposition in the Bible. Dedanites 
These were Arabians that descend from Jokshan, a son of Abraham by Keturah, according to the Bible. She happened to be the third wife of Ibrahim a.s. Bible study tools. So they are Arabs. According to Matthew Henry commentary on the whole Bible, Arabia was a large country, much of it was possessed by the posterity of Abraham. The Dedanim, the Dedanites are mentioned, descended from Dedan, Abraham's son by Keturah. And if we go to Bible Atlas, another Christian map, another Christian Atlas, you will see Dedan, south to Tima, also mentioned in the prophecy. We go to another source, Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionary, Dedanites, Arabian tribe, centered at Al-Ula. Al-Ula is the modern name for Dedan. 70 miles southwest to Tima and 400 miles from Jerusalem. It was a station on the caravan road between Tima and Mecca. They confess. And this is the map of caravan roads before Islam and during Islam time. We see Al-Ula, that is Dedan. And this is Al Medina Munawara. Al Ula is between Taima and Medina. If we go to Google, if you are doubting me as a Jew and a Christian, just Google it up in Google Map. Type Didan, D E D D A N, and it's on the map. And it will also show you which road to take from Jeddah city, where we're talking now, and take it to the Dan. Also, they posted photos from the Dan, Al Ula, northern Saudi Arabia. And Alhamdulillah, I happen to go to the place. And this is a, a photo I took of myself overlooking the new Dadan, Al-Ula city, when we went with the uh, group of Saudi geographers. And this is the ancient Dadan mentioned in the Bible. These are the tombs of the Dadanites. This is where they used to bury their dead ones. And, and we go to another Christian source, Zondervan Textual Encyclopedia of the Bible. Al-Ula is to be identified as the most likely site, they confess, being located 50 miles southwest of Tima. They confess. So now we go back to geography and history. Geographical and historical analysis number four. Lihyan, I want you to remember this name very carefully. Lihyan, in Arabic, is the ancient Arab kingdom. The Lihyanite people were the Dan's original settlers. First they were called the Danites, and then they were called by the tribal name, Lahyani. Dedanite is used for the older phase of the history of this kingdom since their capital name was Dedan. The end of Lahyan kingdom came after the year 24 BC when Dedan fell under Nabataean influence. The Nabataeans are al Ambat in Arabic and they are the ancient people of Jordan. You know, by that time, the Lahyani lost power to the Nabataean. But in the year 106 AD, after Jesus Christ, Rome militarily absorbed the Nabataean kingdom. They were finished. The people of Lahyan, because of the Roman invasion, they had to abandon their place and they moved from their place. And where did they go? Now, remember what Isaiah said. You caravans of the Danites will lodge in the cities of Arabia. Now, was this historical event, the Lahyanite people moving, leaving their place, was it told in Isaiah? Yes. Let us compare now different Bible translations to understand what is meant actually. According now to the uh, international standard version of the Bible, you will camp in the thickets of Arabia, you caravans of the Danites. And we go to modern King James, another translation. You shall stay in the forest of Arabia. And according to the New Living Translation, you will hide in the desert. You will run for your lives, hide. You will abandon your place. We go to Bible commentaries to see if we are right, if we understood or misunderstood, and we find that they agree with us. Matthew Henry says, the poor country people of Dedanite will hereby be forced to flee for shelter whenever they can find a place. And then John Gill's exposition of the Bible also says, because of the ravages of the enemy, the Dedanites would be glad of a lodging in the woods for security. And according to the commentary critical and explanatory on the whole Bible by Robert Jameson and A.R. Faust and David Brown, these uh, very prominent uh, Christian scholars, they said, ye, you, 
that the knights shall be driven through fear of the foe, the enemy, to unfrequented roads. So Isaiah and history agree on this. The prophecy says the people of the Dan, Lahyan, will be driven out of their land seeking a safe refuge to hide. And they did exactly that. And this is historical fact number four. So did Isaiah now say where the refugees from the Dan should hide and go to stay safe? Yes. We notice that some translations use, you will camp in the thickets of Arabia. Other translations say in the forest of Arabia. But there are hundreds of translations of the Bible. If you want to know, to, to, to get to the meaning, you have to compare them all. So we went first to the commentary critical that we mentioned earlier by the three scholars. They wrote, forest here in Isaiah 21.13, not a grove of trees but a region of thick underwood, rugged and inaccessible. For Arabia has no forest or trees. This is according to them. And then we compare now with the biblical translations according to the new revised standard version, NRSV, in the scrub of the desert plain, according to the message translation, in the desert bad lands, you caravans of the Tetanites will camp. According to Holman Christian Study Bible, HCSB, in the desert brush. And according to the Good News Bible, people of the Dan, you whose caravans camp in the barren country. Right, now, now let's go also to the Hebrew child, the lexicon on the Old Testament by this very famous scholar. We went to the, Arab, uh, to the Hebrew verse of the word. And it says, Masa ba'araf bi'a'er ba'araf tabino or hud didanem. The Hebrew word for the thickets, the forest, is ya'er. And we checked it in their dictionary, and it says close to the Arabic. The Arabic Bible, I read it, filwa'er. In the Hebrew, ya'er. What does it mean? Rugged place, whence the verb wa'er, to be rugged, difficult of passage. That is the actual original meaning of the word. And this also, the, this is a picture taken from uh, the Strong's Dictionary of the Bible from blueletterbible.org from a Christian website, quoting uh, Keel and Nevis commentary on the Old Testament. They say, Ya'er here is the solitary barren desert as distinguished, listen very carefully, as distinguished from the cultivated land with its cities and villages. So this Ya'er is uncultivated, it's barren, no grass, no trees. And this brings to mind what the Quran records, the prayer of Prophet Ibrahim, Abraham alayhi salam, in chapter 14, Surah Ibrahim, verse 37. The Quran records the prayer of Ibrahim alayhi salam when he came to Mecca. رَبَّنَا إِنِّي أَسْكَنْتُ مِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِي بِوَادٍ غَيْرِ ذِي زَرْعٍ عِنْدَ بَيْتِكَ الْمُحَرَّمِ Our Lord, I have settled some of my descendants in an uncultivated valley near your sacred house. So the geographical description of Mecca, ever since that time when it didn't have the name, uncultivated valley, barren, isolated, rugged, exactly as the Bible says. But you know, some Jews, some Jewish rabbi and evangelical Christians say, oh, no, no, you're twisting my Bible. You're lying. Let's go to geography. Let's go to Google Map. There's Mecca, you see on the map. And look at the narrow valley of Ibrahim in Mecca. And look at the surrounding mountains. And this is, according to geographers, is the most rugged of all places of Hijaz and mountain range. Geography speaks the truth. It's the scrub of desert plain, and we saw, according to one biblical tra translation, it's the desert badlands, the desert brush, the barren country of Arabia, and it is the solitary barren desert. And there's the Dan again. If you look at the map, if they say, no, no, it's the thickets of Arabia, fine, look at the map. There's Arabia. Just, just tell us, where do you think the thickets of Arabia? Just go, take a look. Obviously, it's the darker spots in Western Arabia. So just by looking at the map, they'll be able to find it, even if they don't go and do this homework we have to do. Ya'er, the Hebrew word, is in the rugged place with difficult passage. This is the actual meaning of the Hebrew word. 
let's go back to geography and history, geographical and historical analysis number five. We saw number four, the people of the Dam Lahyan were driven out of their lands seeking a safe refuge to hide. Now, did they go to Mecca? What are you trying to say? Yes, this is the fact number five. Evidence exists on old tribal maps that the Lahyanites, the Dadanites, existed as a well-established tribe in the area east of Mecca during the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Where is your proof? This. If you go to the seerah of the Prophet, his biography, and read that Bani Lahyan had acted treacherously towards ten of the Prophet's companions and had them hanged. They killed ten of them. The Prophet led an army of 200 Muslim fighters to invade Lahyan, and we all know where it is, in a place called Wuran, just there in, in around Mecca area. So this is from history. The Lahyanite people, the people of the Dan, they left the Dan, and where did they go? They settled in Mecca al This is what Isaiah said. You will lodge in the thickets of Arabia, in this place, in Ya'ar in Arabia, and you will come. Why is this important? But if they still doubt us, you can also go on the map and type Lahyan, L-I-H-Y-A-N, and you will, using Google Map, you will find many areas around Mecca region that bears the name of Lahyan. Like here, Wadi Lahyan, the Valley of Lahyan, like the Well of Lahyan, Bir Lahyan. So, history and geography says they came and they settled in Mecca. There's no doubt about it. But if you, you want to doubt uh, all this, go to Facebook. <laughs> Go to Facebook and type al lahyani family name and you will see so many Saudi Arabians today by the name al lahyani They are descendants of the Dan and you will see that uh, like uh, here the sister, she studied at Jamaat at Umar Khura University, lives in Mecca al mukarrama and another uh, boy, Ahmad al lahyani Kuliyat al in Mecca, the technological college in Mecca. The Lahyanite people still exist till today as an evidence to the fulfillment of this prophecy. So why is the Dan in Isaiah's prophecy? This is how the people of the Dan played their role in the prophecy. For the Jews and the Christians to know when to expect Muhammad As soon as they saw the Dedanites leaving the Dan and coming to Mecca, the Jews came to Arabia. And we will back up this from their own sources. And then when the Dedanites came to Mecca, the Jews knew where the Prophet is going to come out from and where is he going to go. And we will see this also in Isaiah. So the role the Dadanites play is for the Jews to know where are they going and when the Prophet is going to come after that. So by Professor Werner Kaskill, he wrote, The Dan seems to have perished at the end of the third century. Soon afterwards, Pay attention. Soon afterwards, we find in the area a population that writes in Nabatir, among them many Jews who left behind some Hebraic inscriptions in Hebrew. At the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Jews constitu constituted the only population of Wadi Qura as the oasis of the valley of the Dan were sometimes born. As soon as the Dedanites left, the Jews came. Why? for the next event. The first event now, according to the prophecy, the Dan leaving their place to Mecca. What is the second event in Isaiah's prophecy? So we, we know the first event. The second event in the prophecy, the awaited prophet to migrate to the land of Tima from the new hideout place of the Dedanites, from Mecca. This is how the Jews and the Christians knew about it. And we are going to deal now with verse number 14 in the prophecy. Bring water for the thirsty, you who live in Tima. Bring food for the fugitives. So, who is Tima? In Genesis 25, we find his name. In one, in, he's one of the 12 sons of Ishmael, alayhi salam. And then we go, and also Qadar. We will deal with Qadar later. If we go to biblemap.org, all Christian sources, you will find them telling us, Tima, the name of a son of Ishmael, Ismail, son of Abraham, and the tribe descended from him, and of the place where they dwelt, 
This last was a locality in Arabia which probably <coughs> corresponds to the modern Taima city in Arabia, in Saudi Arabia. It still exists. And this is Medina, and there's Taima. And we go to another Bible uh, map, Christian map, they also recognize Taima. Taima. We go to uh, the Zondervan picture encyclopedia of the Bible, and they tell us the place is the same as the modern Taima. It's the same as the modern Taima in North Arabia. A large oasis about halfway between Damascus, Damascus, and Mecca. Two references in the Bible. Pay attention to this. Two references in the Bible tell of the metropolitan position of Taima in the trans desert region. Taima was the capital of an entire region, and Yathrib, there's the old name for Medina, was within the Taima region. The proof is also according to the same source. They tell us Nabonidus, the last king of the neo Babylonian Empire, he lived between the year 556 to 539, conquered North Arabia and made Tima the capital of the western part of his empire. He lived in Taima, Tima for 10 years. So Yathrib and Medina was part of the land of Tima. Isaiah did not say Tima, Isaiah said the land of Tima. So does that mean Al Medina is mentioned here? Yes. Yes, how can we prove this? Jews and Christians knew the relationship between Tima and Medina. If you go to BibleAtlas.org, type Tima, they'll tell you it's north Al Medina, it's about 200 miles north to Medina. So Tima is always mentioned in connection with Al Medina al Munawar. And also they put a map from the Atlas and they showed Tima, Dedan, and Yes, sir. Yes, sir. and Medina on the map. This is a Christian map. I hope they don't change this map after they see the nice picture. So this is Tima, the Dan, and Al Medina al Munawara. When we go to Arabian sources, besides the Islamic narrations and biographies, we find in classical Arabic books of history, poetry, and records of oral tales many references where one speaks of Tima, Tima while actually meaning Yathrib. Also, the Arabs, before the time of Muhammad they used to say Taima and they mean Yathrib. The proof of this is from an Arabian source, a few decades before Islam, two famous Arabians from the tribe of the Prophet they traveled together to greater Syria seeking a new religion other than paganism. A Christian monk told them, the faith you both are seeking is not yet known though this is its age and it shall come out of the land of Tima. How did the monk know? Allah. Allah. The role Tima plays in the prophecy now. We saw the role the Dan played in the prophecy. What is the role of the people of Tima? Meeting the thirsty, bring him water. You that inhabit the land of the south, meet with bread him that fleeth. This is from the Catholic Bible. O inhabitants of the land of Tima, bring water to him who is thirsty. With their bread they met him who fled, according to the New King James Version. And according to the 21st King James, the inhabitants of the land of Tima brought water for him that was thirsty. They were ready with their bread for him that fled. Him, him, him. Who is this him? Who is this him? Bring water for the thirsty. O people of the land of Tima, give bread to the one who is running from trouble, according to the New Living Bible. To meet the thirsty, bring you water. You dwellers in the land of Tima, with bread for him, get in advance of him that is in flight, according to J.B. Rotherham Emphasized Bible. What's going on? Again, God is talking to the people. Support this man. Bring him water. Go before him. Get ready to receive her. And we read here in Exegesis Ready Research Bible, the inhabitants, settlers of the land of Tima, brought water to confront him that was thirsty. They prevented, they anticipated, when they bred him that fled. What does all this mean? 
What does it all mean? Bring water, meat with bread. It means to welcome, to shelter, support the fugitives. This is a direct command from God as we saw. And Yathrib, a direct command from God to the people of Tima. Yathrib is included. They will anticipate the migration of the thirsty, not any thirsty. Him that fled and they got out to meet him. Again, if we go to Hebrew, this verse 14 reads like this. لَكْرَيْتْ تِسَمِيهِ تَيُّ مَيْمْ يُشْفَيْ إِرَتْ سْتِمَا بِلِحْمُ كِدَّامُ نِدِيد The word kiddamu in Hebrew means go before him, get ready to receive him. And it's close to Arabic because Hebrew and Arabic they are Semitic languages. Kiddamu is kiddamu, go before him, rush to receive him and welcome him. You know, how many, des how many thirsty people in the desert? Everyone is thirsty in the desert. Everyone is, is in need of water. But this thirsty person, you know, God sent a revelation for him. He must be a very special. He must be a man of God. And then we read, we carry on, from Albert Barnes' notes in the Bible, another Christian source, to bring water to the thirsty was an act of hospitality and especially in eastern countries where water was so scarce. The Arabs do not need a Jewish prophet with all due respect to come and tell them bring water for the thirsty. This, the Arabs were known for this. So this proves that this thirsty person is not any thirsty. He is very special. He's going to come to you people of the land of Tima. Support him. Go and meet him. So Everyone is thirsty in Arabia, we mentioned that. Let's deal now with geographical and historical analysis number six. Let's go to geography and history. Let's see if there is a reference to that. The people of the land of Tima did not welcome any refugees, not that they support anyone's migration to them in history, except one. Who? The Prophet That's it. If you go and open the history of the entire region of Tima, they only did that to one man and to one people, group of people. Muhammad and his followers. That's history. And this is the history that changed history. We date our Arabic Islamic history from that day. The Islamic Hijri year. So there's no doubt about it. And the people of Medina were called Al-Ansar, the helpers, from that day on. They cannot deny that either. So Isaiah 21:14 says they anticipated his migration and went before to meet him. We already mentioned that Hebrew word, you can see it. This is a capture from a Christian website called blueletterbible.org and you find the meaning they gave for the word kidemo, to meet, to confront, to come to meet, to receive, to go before, to go in front, to be in front, to come in front, to confront, to anticipate. Now, Let's go back to facts of history and geography. The people of Yathrib Medina would come every morning. I'm quoting from al rahiq al-Makhtoum. It's one of the most famous sources, Islamic sources on the life of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In English, it's called the sealed nectar. We read it. The people of Yathrib Medina would come every morning and wait eagerly for his appearance until forced by the unbearable heat of the midday sun to return. One day they had gone as usual, and after a long wait and watch, they retired to the city, when a Jew, catching a glimpse of three travelers clad in white, winding their way to Medina, shouted from the top of a hillock, a Jew shouted, Oh, you people of Arabia, your grandfather has come. whom you have been eagerly waiting for, has come. The Muslims immediately rushed holding their weapons to defend him. The joyful news soon spread through the city and people marched forward to greet their noble guest. Can you deny that? And we move to verse 15 in Isaiah. For he has fled from swords, from the drawn sword, from the bent bow, and from the heat of battle. What does that mean? Isaiah spoke about the night before Hijrah, the migration of the Prophet Again, going back to Rahik al-Makhtoum, we read, The 
chiefs of pagan Mecca posted assassins, killers, around the Prophet's house. Thus they kept vigil all night long, waiting to kill Muhammad the moment he left his house early in the morning. And also the books of Sirah tell us that they schemed to have one man from every tribe strike the Prophet with their swords from every tribe all at once. Thus it would be hard to seek revenge from all the tribes, but Allah saved it. <coughs> Peace be upon Isaiah said what? For he has fled from swords, from the drawn sword, from the bent bow, and from the heat of battle. So he fled from who? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To the people of Tima. In verse 16, it says, For this is what the Lord is saying to me. Within three years, according to the years of a contract worker, the pomp of Qidar will come to an end. Qidar. Did he run away from Qidar? Who is Qidar? So we already said that Isaiah speaks about three people, three places, and three events. We are moving now to the third place, to the third group of people, and to the third event. And we will conclude, inshallah, with this shortly. We already saw, in according to Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapter uh, 25, verse 13, that Qaidar and Tima were from the 12 sons of Ishmael, a.s. And according to Christian and Biblical dictionaries, Smith Bible Dictionary, the name of a great tribe of Arabs, Qaidar, the tribe seems to have been one of the most conspicuous of all Ishmaelite tribes, and hence the rabbins, the Jewish rabbis, called the Arabians universally by that name. And according to another source, the name Qaidar is here in Isaiah 21, the collective name of Arabic tribes generally. So Qaidar means all Arabs. And another uh, source, Inter International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, Qaidar must have been one of the most important, and thus in later times the name came to be applied to all the wild tribes of the desert. It is through Qaidar that Muslim genealogists trace the descent of Muhammad, peace be upon him, from Ishmael. This is quoting their source. So Qaidar also means the tribe of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Qaidar also means any powerful Arabian tribe. According to Ernest Axel Knopf, a biblical scholar who undertook a historical study of the Ishmaelites, he surmises that the name of the Qadarites was derived from the verb Qadara with its meaning to ordain to have power. And then he says medieval Jewish sources also usually identified Qaidar with Arabs and Muslims. So let's go back to historical and geographical analysis number seven. The Quraysh were the most powerful merchant tribe that controlled Mecca during the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Muhammad was born to Banu Hashim clan of Quraysh tribe, peace be upon him. All the Arabs of the Hijaz are descendants of Nabayoth, one of the sons of Ishmael, and Qaidah, his second son. And there's a map that shows the tribes of Arabia, and you can see in Mecca, Quraysh tribe. And this was the master tribe of all Arabia. The most feared, the richest, and the most powerful. Qidar. The Bible says Qidar stands for the most powerful Arabian tribe, the tribe of Muhammad, an Ishmaelite, son of Ishmael, and this fits Quraysh. So Quraysh is Qidar. Now, Muhammad Sallallahu fled from who? From the people of Quraysh, the chiefs of Quraysh. They wanted to kill him. And now, in, the, in that verse, what role does Qaidar play now? We saw the role of the Dadanites, we saw the role of Tima, we saw the role of Qaidar, and this is now the last role, and we will conclude with this. Muhammad وسلم, and his followers had to migrate from Mecca to Medina, seeking protection from the swords of Quraysh, Qaidar. It was Qaidar that drove them out of the land to the land of Tima. This is, this is the second event in Isaiah. Qaidar will wage war in one year after the second event and lose it badly. This is the third event. So the third event, according to Isaiah, following the second event, Hijrah of the Prophet, Isaiah says, within three years, what will happen to Qaidar? Qaidar will suffer a heavy loss and will be defeated in a war against him. 
Isaiah 21, 16. And many of Kedar's greatest and best warriors will fall in great numbers in the battle. This is Isaiah 21, 17. We will now read it together again. Within three years, according to the year of a content walker, the pomp of Kedar will come to an end. 17, the last verse. And there will be few archers, those who are descendants of Pedar, who survive because the Lord God of Israel has spoken. Let us ask the Arabs and Muslims, did such battle take place sure. after the migration of the Prophet? Yes. It's called what? Battle of Badr. It happened. So the date was Sunday, March 13, the year 624 AD, 17th of Ramadan, second year of Hijrah. The second year following the migration of the Prophet, within three years, Isaiah said. Location at the wells of Badr, 80 miles, 180, 130 kilometers southwest of Medina. And the result, decisive Muslim victory. It is the victory that announced to all Arabian tribes a new power has arrived. This map shows the caravans of the, the pagans of Mecca, they rushed from Syria. And they went to Mecca for, and then they gathered the army to Badr where the Muslim army met them there. This is the Battle of Badr according to Isaiah 6, 21, 16 and 17. It happened exactly as we read in the New Revised Standard Version. And the remaining bows of Kedar warriors will be few for the Lord, the God of Israel has spoken. Did that happen? The few Alam faithful miraculously defeated the mighty men of Kedar who sought to destroy the Muslims and intimidate their own force who turned, who turned to Islam. Muhammad's well-disciplined force broke the Meccan lines, killing several important Quraysh leaders, including Muhammad's chief antagonist, whose name was Amr ibn Hisham Abu Jah. Also, we read from the history of the battle that Quraysh, Qaidah, lost about 70 warriors and leaders and 70 ended captured exactly as Isaiah said. So we dedicate this to Rabbi Menes Friedman of Minnesota who said let's destroy Medina. I don't know, he ran away from the debate but uh, we say Allahu Akbar alhamd. If any evangelical in the United States of America, if any Jew is mad enough to debate this issue, please we would be more than glad to meet you anywhere at any place you meet. Wallah al mustaz Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. In, in, for further information, inshallah, on the subject, for the time being, we have uh, this book. This is uh, the academic research accredited by Umm al Qura University and Medina Research Center. It's called Makkah al Mukarramah wal Medina al Munawara fil Kitab al Muqaddas, Makkah and Medina in the Bible, co authored with a famous uh, geographer. Professor Dr. Laila Zazou, who assisted me geographically in the research. Inshallah, we hope soon to publish the English uh, one. Make dua for us, pray for us. May Allah accept. Thank you very much for attending and for patiently bearing with me. This is my email, emudir at about.me. If any evangelicals who might be watching this, or Jewish rabbis also, if they want to destroy Mecca and Medina in the future, they can write to us so that we can invite them for Arabian coffee and uh, we can talk. Yes, bring your proof if you are speaking the truth. Either they are ignorant of their Bibles and their Torah or they don't want their people to know. We make, we make dua, we pray that may Allah guide them, may Allah guide us and may Allah open their hearts and our hearts with this. I conclude wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala sayyidi wa habibi We will open the floor for questions and answers. I'm sorry that uh, I took uh, more time because we had to start uh, 10 minutes uh, after time to, uh, wait, to, to wait for more of you to come. One question at the time and please within one minute so that we can accommodate more questions very quickly. After the question and answer session Please join us upstairs for some refreshments. And before you leave, there's a yellow pad that we will pass, inshallah. Brother Dr. Tanwir is, is holding. 
If you can write your name and email so that in the future, inshallah, the forum uh, uh, conducting any more talks, uh, you could be invited. Any question, any comment in less than one minute? Really, very, very documented study. I should, we should all congratulate Dr. Madhir. He has done a human's job, and actually, this will create a sort of revolution in, the, in their camps. And inshallah, we will support him all the way. Inshallah. Thank you very much. Sir, one question that yes, is in my heart. Yes. That, uh, is all things were predestined, then what is our role? I'm sorry, can you repeat that again? The things which you eliminated here, yes. were predestined by Allah? Yes. What is our role then? We need to go and tell them. <laughs> because as you see, there are so many Quranic verses that says, the Jew and the Christians knew. Their prophets told them. Like the verse I shared earlier from Surah al -Rad. Chapter 13, verse 43. They knew, those, especially those who have knowledge on the Bible, they knew everything about the Prophet. Wherever Mecca and Medina is mentioned in the Bible, and for an example, Mecca alone is mentioned in no less than 37 places in the Bible, believe it or not. And they are trying their best to hide it. Like for an example, in the Arabic version of the Bible from published in Beirut, Lebanon, for the Catholics, published by Dar al Mashir Publishing House. You know what the Arab Catholics did in Lebanon? It says, Fi Bilad al Arab, in Arabia, in the country of the Arabs. They took it out and they say, Fil Araba. Now, Al Araba is a narrow valley near Jordan. It's not Arabia. This is the tricks they play because they know. They want to change it and they want to hide it. They took the name Arabia completely and they substituted it with Al Araba. But if you compare it against the other translations, you, you can catch the trick. They're playing on their own. So Allah tells us also in the Quran that they know Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi as they know their own sons. Yes. So all these places in the Bible, speaking about Mecca and Medina, happen to be in the context of prophecies concerning Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which we call in Arabic Al-Bisharat. So they know it. But the, their followers don't know. As you, so let's, let's hope, inshallah, that we need to talk to them and open that. If we give them the translation of the meaning of the Holy Quran, again, if they read, the Quran tells them Muhammad Sallallahu is in the Bible. So for further reading on the subject, I can find no better book than the book of my mentor and teacher, Shaykh Ahmad Idaf, Rahmatullah, The Choice, Volume 1. It has four books, Muhammad Sallallahu in the Bible, Muhammad Sallallahu the natural successor to Christ, Muhammad Sallallahu the greatest, and Al-Quran, the miracle of miracles. If you want to master those biblical prophecies, there is no better book than this. It's available in, in Saudi Arabia at Jalil Bookstore, and you can order it, also published by Dal al-Manara in uh, Egypt, and all of Shaykh Ahmad Tidat's book, Rahmatullah has no copyrights. So anyone can print and circulate and give up. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, uh, the mic there. Yeah, I just want to ask about something. As you know that they change the Bible and they change the Old Testament. Yes. And uh, they keep changing. Uh, yeah, they keep changing it. And there is many copies. There yes. are many copies. Uh, yes. They have it. Yes. So can we find this right now? In it's all, they all made it available online, free. Online? It's all available online, free. Okay. They all made it available online, free. Okay. And so the, the, the catch is still there. But you see, for us Muslims, this does not increase our faith in the beloved Sallallahu We need this to talk to them, to us, Medina is holy. It's an established fact. To us, what we know from the life of Muhammad Sallallahu even whatever little we know is sufficient for us, but this is for them. So, Alhamdulillah, if you, it's all available. It's all available. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. You're welcome. Thank you for attending. And, uh, it's really inspired me. Alhamdulillah. But uh, basically, I have a uh, personal question. Yes. Uh, I have been watching. Not
related to the topic? Well, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's have been, I have been working in Africa for, uh, for a missionary uh, organization. You worked for a missionary organization? Yeah, it's, it's not directly, but it's like oh, okay. I have a vehicle for transportation. But you, you are born Muslim? I'm a Muslim. Alhamdulillah, okay. But they use my car for a transportation reason from uh, from place to place. Right, right. So is it is it is it forbidden to cooperate with them in, uh, in that subject? It's hard. I, I'm, I stop. I'm not doing that job right now, but it was. So well, you know, I, I, I'm not. I'm afraid to touch on uh, issues of halal and haram. But make sure you you fill your cars with Didat's books. <laughs> if they have to use your car, make sure you wire your car. Not with bombs, with books yeah. of Sheikh Ahmed Dida. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure they won't be they won't be happy to use your car after that. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay, more questions related to the topic only, please. If there are any, or we conclude, inshallah. Yes, Mabu, hi, brother. Salam alaikum. Uh, uh, actually, I didn't want to have uh, to talk, but uh, you mentioned uh, one of the greatest Muslim uh, comparative state. Uh, Religion, Ahmadidat. Ahmadidat uh, uh, founded the Inter Islamic Propagation Center International in Durban. Yes. Uh, for the purpose of producing a duplicate of himself. I no, mean, no, 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 no. Uh, for the purpose of spreading the faith yes. of Islam. Yes. And uh, they yes. have also. He said, if you allow me to interrupt, uh, he said the purpose was to help Muslims. Fulfill the command of the Prophet وسلم, which he gave each and every one of us when he said Convey the message on my behalf even if it's one verse. You know one verse. You don't need Ahmadidat. Um, you need that one verse and you need to take it out and convey it to the people. This is what Ahmadidat dedicated his life for. May Allah reward him. Sorry, but I needed to correct you there. Uh, no problem. Please carry on. Uh, but my point is that yes. uh, uh, the presentation you have uh, presented to us yes. is uh, uh, very good, Yani. Uh, and if any one of us, for example, mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of uh, Filipinos here, as you know, yes. Philippines is a Christian country, as they say. Yes, yes. It was uh, a Muslim country before. Inshallah. Uh, yes, and it will be. The capital Islam. was Amanullah, yes. and they changed it to Manila. Uh, that's what they said, but yes. the claim was not always right. Yeah, well, it's not always Amanullah, because. Manila means Mainilad. Mainilad is something, a flower, right. uh, there in the river, and they okay. said Mainilad. There is a Nilad in the uh, river. Okay. And some people so, said Amanullah. What do we need to do now? With uh, the um, it's just a suggestion, sir, that yes. uh, if you can produce, for example, a lot of like you, Stop what I mean is that uh, you, you can uh, no, no, create no, no, a center. No, no. I got your point, Jazakallah Khair. Hand over the mic. We need one verse from the Quran. You don't need the likes of Ahmadidat or anybody. You need one verse from the Quran, take it to heart and go and tell the Christians. That's what you need. For an example, when I first met Sheikh Ahmadidat in person in the year 1989, he told me the Quran is in Arabic, right? It was revealed in Arabic. Your language, you know it without the need of a translation. But you as an Arab, you need this translation more than the Arabs. Because now, you know Qul Hu Allah Ahad, Surah Al-Ikhlas. This was a direct response to the claim of the Christians regarding the Trinity, that God is one of the three, that Jesus Christ is the begotten Son of God. So, the Surah Al-Ikhlas came down to reply to this. Do you know by, Do you know it by Arabic? I said, yes, Sheikh, of course, since I came to know how to talk. Very young age. He said, right, now translate it in English. You see a Filipino Christian, you tell him, please, can I have two minutes of your time? I would like to convey one verse from the Quran, from Allah to you. Now say, Qul huwa Allah ahad. And I was stuck. I didn't know what to say. I know the Quran without the need of a translation, but now I need the translation to talk to somebody who doesn't yeah, know Arabic. Right. So he helped me, Rahmatullah alayhi, learn for the first time Surah Al Ikhlas in Arabic and English. Say, He is Allah, the one and only. Allah is Samad. Allah is the absolute eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He does not beget, nor was he begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kufu ahad. And there is absolutely nothing unto him. Thank you, sir, for your time. Now I can invite you for coffee. I conveyed the message. Thank you. This was, and you know, this was the first exercise. He told me, if you don't memorize these verses, I don't want to see your face again. Don't come to me. And he gave me a free copy of a translation 
just like this one by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. From that day on, when every Filipino that I used to see at age 19, I used to chase, hey, Assalamu alaikum, Babu Hari, how are you? Can I have two minutes with you? And all I did was just recite Qulu Allah at the translation. And one day, as Allah is my witness, I was talking to a Filipino Christian for three hours about the Trinity. And I forgot what Shaykh Ida told me to read the Quran first. At the end, I was so tired of that guy, hot headed guy, stubborn. And then I made him read the translation himself. I opened it for him and I made him read. And wallah, I swear by Allah, I'm a witness to this. That Filipino had hair on his head. I saw his hair standing up. He had goosebumps. He stood up. SubhanAllah. Just right after he finished Surah Al-Ikhlas. It didn't happen to me. Born into Islam, as in from Mecca. And it happened to a kafir, a disbeliever. He had faith entering his heart. Three weeks later, I heard him praise Allah. Not by me, not by Ida, by Qulhu Allah Ahad That's how you start. Wa akhiru da'wana, alhamdulillah, rabbal alameen. Jazakumullah khair, it's time for Isha. And uh, we have the refreshments upstairs. So please join us. Again, I thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for your question. Uh,